Welcome to the BEAT Anaphylaxis launch event. My name is Jill Vance and I'm Professor of Medical Education at Newcastle University and Honorary Consultant in Paediatric Allergy at the Great North Children's Hospital. It's my pleasure to chair tonight's meeting. Tonight's session is the culmination of a huge amount of hard work. It's an opportunity for us to introduce formally an important project which sets out to improve the care that we give children and young people who are living with a risk of anaphylaxis. And we're going to do this through high quality education. So as an educationalist and an allergist, it's my particular pleasure to be involved in this project. This is a project which crosses boundaries. It crosses health and education, primary and secondary settings, and professional groups. And our audience tonight represents all of these groups. And I wanted to welcome you all and to thank you for giving up your time on a Thursday evening for this event. Now, tonight uh, is dependent on two very important people. One is Dr. Andrew Bright. Andrew is a senior trainee in our region, and he has uh, led a team of interested and willing clinicians in this project. I want to personally thank him for his passion and for all his patience in leading us through this project. The second member tonight is Dr. Paul Turner who is an amazing clinician and researcher from Imperial College London, and he's led much important work in this area. And before Paul speaks, Andrew will give an overview of our project and then share details of the project um, in relation to the website itself and how we're going about our evaluation and what data we have to date. Now, we want to involve you, the audience, in this session, so please do share your comments, your ideas, your suggestions, your critique in the chat room. And at points in our sessions, we'll invite you to, to speak uh, and share your views in person. Finally, I just want to acknowledge our funders. That's the Great North Children's Hospital Foundation, the Catherine Cookson Foundation, and the Research and Development Department at Newcastle upon Tynes Hospital. I also wanted to thank our organiser, Ross Scott, who has done an amazing job in, in pulling uh, a lot of the management of tonight's event together. And of course, to the many contributors in the audience who supported the project to date. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Andrew, who will give an overview of the project. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for that kind introduction. So why are we here today? Well, we're here today for stories just like this one. You may have noticed this news article uh, been in the media over the last few days. It's a very sad tale of um, a local young person. Ellen was 16 years old. She was from Blythe, just down the road. Um, and she had a whole life ahead of her with dreams of becoming a space scientist. Tragically, she died in October of 2019, following what the coroner described as an anaphylactic reaction to a food she had eaten. And um, she suffered subsequent brain injury, which led to her sad demise. She'd had a history of previous reactions to nuts and positive allergy tests in clinic to nuts, fish and shellfish. She was also an asthmatic, although this was described as being well controlled. I'm just going to leave you to think about that very sad tale that happened very close to home. Move on to something a little bit more cheery, that's background for the project. So who am I? I'm a paediatric trainee at the latter stages of my time as a registrar and I have a special interest in paediatric allergy. During my time uh, in region working several different NHS trusts I've 
um, had the privilege of managing anaphylaxis in lots of those different organizations. One of the things that struck me during that time and also my time in, in follow-up clinic um, for allergy purposes was there was a, a great deal of variability in the kind of care delivered to children and young people suffering with anaphylaxis, but also the education that's provided to those patients and their families um, discharge. Now, we all know anaphylaxis is a very low frequency event. And that means that we don't, as individual clinicians, see it very often, maybe once or, or twice a year if we're lucky. So discussions with colleagues and thinking about that experience made me start to have an idea of would there be a better way to equip the average paediatrician or emergency doctor um, in better managing this condition. This wandering also led me to do um, kind of audits and quality improvement projects in several trusts um, over the last few years. And I'm really happy to say that that's culminated in us um, kind of organizing collaboration across all the trusts in the Northeast of England to do a annual regional audit. Alongside all of that, I also was aware and um, kind of present during a kind of increased success of uh, another project, which was run by Jennifer Townsend, Great North Children's Hospital. She developed a web-based um, resource called Beat Asthma, and that has gone from strength to strength and is now um, being syndicated on a national level. Through all of this, and combining those experiences, um, we all started to wonder whether we might be able to do something similar for anaphylaxis and that's how beat anaphylaxis and uh, the quality improvement project um, developed. So I'm going to show you the project outline now and this is a slide that I'll refer back to throughout my subsequent talks. So the first phase of the project was a regional audit which I've mentioned which was the aim was to look at patterns of pediatric anaphylaxis in the region but also how our clinical care um, measured up to the nice um, clinical guidance 134 recommendations and we initially did um, a 12 month period from the beginning of 2019 till its conclusion we're toying with the idea of repeating that for 2020 as well so we collected data from seven trusts during the period of March to July last year and presented those um, at regional meetings towards the end of that period. Secondly, we spent uh, about five or six months developing a website and also the resources it contains. The website's um, beatanaphylaxis.co.uk and the resources have been developed in a co-design process using um, focus groups to, uh, with educators, health professionals and patients to really develop uh, resources that are specific um, for each of those stakeholder groups. Thirdly, we did and it was towards the end of the same period, in November and December, we did a health professionals knowledge survey. Now this is a pre-implementation of the resort survey of health professionals, knowledge about anaphylaxis and its management, and it makes up a baseline data set, which we can then use to compare and evaluate its impact. The fourth phase is implementation. Um, and after 12 months, period of rolling out this resource and promoting it we um, will across northeastern Cumbria we will look to uh, move on to the final stage which is the evaluation of its impact we'll do that in three ways or four ways regional re-audit of clinical care which we're going to look at the year 2021 
following implementation for 12 months. We'll do a post implementation knowledge survey. We'll basically repeat step three. Um, we also are gathering data via web user analytics from the website and the platforms that host some of the resources such as YouTube. And we have a um, direct feedback portal on the website. So we'll be analyzing qualitatively that information. Alongside um, the rollout period, we'll also be holding further um, educator and patient fo focus groups along with health professionals to refine and develop the resources and analyze any information we get during those processes. And as I said, we, we needed phase one and three to act as the baseline data set to be able to measure the impact following implementation. So we've completed phase one, phase two and phase three. And we're now just at the start of phase four following this launch. I'll now hand you back to Professor Vance who will introduce our keynote speaker. Thanks very much indeed, Andrew. That was a really helpful overview. So, so yes, let me now introduce Paul Turner, um, who is Reader in Paediatric Allergy and Clinical Immunology at Imperial College London. Now, I've known Paul for, for many years, and he continues to uh, amaze me and make me feel humbled, really, by how much and how fantastic the work you've done in, relation, in, in research in general but certainly your your perspective, uh, your work in anaphylaxis has been second to none. And as Andrew and I were thinking about today's launch event, we couldn't think of anyone better than to uh, share the national perspective. So thank you, Paul, for your time. Um, thank you for sharing your thoughts on food anaphylaxis in the UK, um, how common and how to treat it. Thank you very much. Jill, thanks for that very kind introduction. It's a pleasure to um, be able to um, have about half an hour or so um, this evening just to talk about where we're at in terms of improving acute care for anaphylaxis in the UK. Um, and so I'm going to kick straight on just in the interest of time. Um, I'm sure lots of you are aware of the various differing definitions that we have for anaphylaxis. Um, I put here in the literature, but actually these are national societies and international societies um, across the world. So we've got a yaki, and as you can see, they describe it as a severe life-threatening hypersensitivity reaction or a fatal multi-system, multi-organ system reaction. The World Allergy Organization, this is an old definition or description, um, again, referring to life-threatening reactions. And there's the Americans, the Joint Academy and College in America also talk about an acute life-threatening reaction. Um, some have a more nuanced approach, um, and so it's separate to the idea of it being a multi-organ um, uh, type reaction, um, at least in Australia, and I think this is probably my more favourite um, description, it's described as a serious allergic reaction that may cause death, and I like that nuance for reasons that I'll talk about over the next couple of minutes, but also the nuance that there's anaphylaxis, which is serious, a reaction, but then there's severe anaphylaxis, which is when someone's life is in danger. And I think it's really important to try and unpick some of the fear that exists over anaphylaxis because it's counterproductive for patients and their families. And it's also counterproductive to healthcare professionals delivering the best care. And actually, we really need to spot the difference between a normal anaphylaxis reaction which is not life-threatening, but needs to be taken seriously because it could progress, and a proper life-threatening anaphylaxis reaction, which if we don't intervene appropriately, will cause death. And so just some things to think about. The first is that if we consider anaphylaxis to be a systemic reaction, what about people, kids or adults, who just have generalized skin reactions? So here's a young baby who, well, maybe not so young because he's a bit chubby, um, as lots of kids are of this age, and is clearly having a generalised skin reaction. Now that presumably must be systemic. He hasn't smeared himself with milk or peanut. 
there must be something in the blood that is driving an allergic response in the skin, which we have to remember is the biggest immune organ that we have and the biggest organ actually that we have to a degree. Um, and so the idea of anaphylaxis being a systemic reaction, well, it sort of falls down because otherwise we're going to be treating every skin reaction as anaphylaxis and clearly a, a skin reaction on their own is not anaphylaxis. What about a reaction that involves more than two organs? Well, this is problematic. Here's a picture of a well-known child that many of us would have seen before because it's one of the, an, the allergic pictures that does rounds. And let's say as well as having a little bit of lip angioedema, he's got a little bit of tummy symptoms, a little bit of gut symptoms, maybe some tummy pain or is feeling a bit sick. Now, is that anaphylaxis? Because in this country, we would say no. In America, some people would say yes, but most people, if it's just mild gut symptoms, would say no. But then we do have two organs involved. And actually, there are research papers out there that would say this is anaphylaxis because we use the definition of two organ involvement. So again, the definition fails. What about someone who has respiratory symptoms in isolation? So they get a sudden asthma attack straight after eating a food they're allergic to. And in real life, you're not, maybe you're not always sure that's the case, but we see this a lot in food immunotherapy. They have their dose and within five or 10 minutes, they're having asthma symptoms, no other symptoms, single organ involvement, arguably, I would say this is a serious reaction that needs appropriate treatment because it is anaphylaxis. And yet, according to many definitions, including the American NIAID fan definition, this is not anaphylaxis. And believe it or not, I've had clinicians who tell me, no, 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 we're going to be getting a bit of salbutamol out here. And I'm like, going, are you guys crazy? You give adrenaline for skin and a little bit of gut. And then there's someone who's got asthma after exposure to a food allergen. And are you seriously telling me you're not going to be reaching for the adrenaline? But that is what they say. And then we have the spectrum. So now we're moving into respiratory and cardiovascular compromise. And this is where there's a spectrum of severity or what we're interested in, a spectrum of risk to life. And we need to understand the spectrum. That there's a spectrum of allergic reactions and the anaphylaxis is towards one end. But then there's severe anaphylaxis, which is what is life-threatening, and that's what we need to be very careful about improving the care of. Now, some of you may be aware of what I've got up on here, which is the updated anaphylaxis guidance from the World Allergy Organization. Now, there is a conflict of interest. I'm chair of the anaphylaxis committee for the WAO. Um, and so this is, we, we, we pushed this through, but actually there's a lot of consensus amongst committee members that this made far more sense. And so what we now have is skin involvement with either an A, B or C symptom. So A for airway breathing, B for, B, A for airway I like prefer, B for breathing and C for circulation. And then occasionally we get an other that comes into that. So arguably if it's a food allergen and you've got really severe abdominal symptoms, like you're thinking this person needs morphine, I think that will probably do for anaphylaxis. Where it becomes confusing is that if we're talking about bee stings or venom stings, actually, if you get any gut symptoms after a venom sting, that is most definitely anaphylaxis because it's been stung on your arm, but you're having systemic symptoms, including the gut, and you shouldn't be having that. That's in contrast to a food allergen where actually the food is sitting in your gut. And so arguably you could say any gut response is just a local response. It's not something we need to worry about. So that's the sort of skin plus one other. But then we've got this new category, which used to be limited to just hypotension, but we've now changed it. So bronchospasm, so asthma symptoms alone, or laryngeal symptoms alone after exposure to a known allergen warrants treatment with adrenaline. And at the moment, it's interesting, there's just been a paper in America that's come out to say this would be, one of those reactions would be a grade five allergic reaction but not anaphylaxis, which does not make any sense to me at all. If you're saying it's the most severe allergic reaction we can describe, surely that would then warrant treatment as anaphylaxis. And that's something that we're picking up at the moment with the authors. The next thing to flag up, and I think Andrew is half right here, he said that maybe in an emergency department, you just get one or two cases of anaphylaxis um, a year. Um, 
I, I think certainly in paediatrics in London, in, in paediatric a &Es, we're getting more than that. And maybe there's a north-south divide here, not another one. And that's something else that I think Boris Johnson can think about if there is. But I think importantly, most anaphylaxis by the time it comes to hospital is no longer anaphylaxis. Either they've used their adrenaline pens or the paramedics who never cease to impress me with how good they are with very severe anaphylaxis reactions. They've sorted these people out already. So by the time to come in, it's just like, oh, it's boring already. And that probably explains the amazing figure to me that if you are still having anaphylaxis by the time you come to the hospital, you have around a one to 2% chance of dying, which is mind boggling because anaphylaxis death is so vanishingly rare that one in two out of a hundred seems crazy to me. But actually these are people who are still having anaphylaxis who have not responded to initial treatment. And this is a group that we need to particularly focus on. What this slide shows, and this is work done by colleagues, so um, uh, uh, Dr. Masunta and, and Robert Boyle at Imperial, um, they looked at the likelihood of bad things happening to you if you have a food allergy. In this case, we're focused on zero to 19 year olds, so young people with food allergy. And we looked at the likelihood of, you know, coming to the A&E because you've broken your arm or twisted your ankle or been injured in a car accident or something, or being killed by any cause or dying in an accident in America or being murdered. Um, you'll see the big difference, you know, one log difference between being murdered in the States and being murdered in Europe, that's called gun control. And maybe now that we've got a, a, a slightly more nuanced political situation in America, there may be some change in that to narrow that gap between Europe and the USA. And then we've got death due to lightning. Now, what about something bad happening to you because of your food allergy? Well, roughly one in 10 allergic teenagers report in any year they've had anaphylaxis. Someone like me agreeing with them, probably about one in 10 of those. There's a lot of over diagnosis, a lot of the label of anaphylaxis is thrown around and banded around a lot. And actually when you take a proper history, maybe only 10% of people who say they've had anaphylaxis actually have done. Being admitted to hospital because of anaphylaxis, and this is data that preceded the changes in NICE guidance that said we should all be admitted, especially if you're a young person, so maybe it's a marker of severity, 10% of those. And then dying from food anaphylaxis, it's actually about one in quarter of a million. And so dying from food induced allergic reactions is vanishingly rare. And we have to understand why. It's not because it's something that just never happens and therefore we should tell our patients, what are you making a fuss about? For God's sake, get on with life and live it because I, first of all, that's just not true. Second of all, if you're lucky, you'll just get reported to PALS in your hospital and not the GMC, if that's your regulatory body. And thirdly, I think as, as healthcare professionals, we need to actually acknowledge the elephant in the room, which is this is something that people feel they cannot control. And so actually there's a huge fear factor because no, no one knows if their kid or then themselves are gonna be the next fatality that makes the headlines on the papers. But where I think this data is useful is that you can see we're more likely to die in a car accident than from food allergy. We don't not get in our cars, we get in our cars, we put a seat belt on, we follow the highway code, we stop at red lights, hopefully. The car has been safety rated, they're airbags. There's all this safety netting in place so that something that is actually relatively risky becomes at least perceived as a safe thing to do. And for me, that's what we're missing often when we do food allergy, when we manage patients with food allergy. It's about the safety netting in place so that our patients can lead normal lives and actually as clinicians, and I include non-medical clinicians in that, we're not just saying, no, you can't eat peanut, no, you can't do this, no, you can't do that. But actually our job is to say, yes, you can. Here's your safety netting, here are your adrenaline auto injectors, here's you knowing what to do and how to look after yourself. And that's how we make a real impact on our patients. Now, I was really disheartened um, at the, oh, just over a year ago when I saw this headline which was some data commissioned by the Natasha Allergy Research Foundation that they basically pulled out a load of data from NHS England to look at severe reactions. And the problem is that the data that underpins 
um, these numbers, you have to understand how it's generated and its limitations. And I remember being contacted about six months ago by someone who told me, um, have I got any comments? 7% of deaths in the UK are caused by allergies. And I was like, no, they're not, no, they're not. And what has happened is that someone who doesn't know about the data had gone to ONS, the re great repository that we have in this country, and I'm not being sarcastic here, and said, what deaths have an allergy code associated with them? And due to the way some people, and it would seem to be lots of people rather than just a few people, codes deaths, there were lots of death certificates that for some reason said hay fever on it. And so all of a sudden, all these deaths were being coded as due to allergy because there's an allergy code on the death certificate or something like that. And it's really essential to understand the data. And what we found when we looked at the data is actually in red, this is the real, these are the real numbers. But these numbers are people admitted to hospital following an allergic reaction. And an allergic reaction, especially in under 18s, if you follow NICE guidance, is not a severe allergic reaction. So we really do need to be careful about how we use these numbers. And actually it's relatively good news. If you look at hospital admissions for food allergy across the world, and there's good data essentially just for these four areas in terms of over the last 10 to 20 years, you can see that yes, there is an increase for sure, but we're certainly doing better than Australia. But if we then look at what we're really worried about, which is deaths or very severe anaphylaxis, and that's important because remember NICE says, if you're a kid and you pitch up to hospital with anaphylaxis, you should be admitted. Now guidelines are guidelines, they're meant to be broken, but lots of people don't break them and they follow them. If we look at the case fatality rate, so this is the proportion of people who get admitted, who then die from food allergy, you will see that that rate is stonkingly low for food. And that sort of 1% rate that I mentioned before is essentially for non-food triggers. And for food, arguably, we're actually doing better. It's incredibly low, it's been low and stable for the last 20 years. And actually, we're doing much better than some other countries particularly America. And even if you look at Australia, where we had that huge increase in hospital admissions, and they don't have guidelines in Australia that says you have to be admitted following anaphylaxis. Even in Australia, it's good news with respect to fatalities. And actually, this is really important information to get out. And it, 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 this data is now going to be published and hopefully come out soon in the BMJ. Because our patients deserve good news. They deserve to know that if anything, maybe in hospitals, we're getting better at managing anaphylaxis, although clearly there's still work to do. There's more information to learn from these data. And in particular, what concerns me is over the last 20 to 25 years, we're seeing more deaths due to milk. And in children, milk is now the most common allergen, single allergen in terms of causing fatal anaphylaxis. And so what's really crucial is that there's a huge amount of awareness in the population now about peanut and nut allergies, but that's where the real danger is. And we somehow need to get that message out there. So now onto the second part of my talk. Um, many of you will be aware of the Resource Council UK guidelines for anaphylaxis, which are now a little bit old. And so they need updating. And as Andy Warhol said, you've actually got to do stuff yourself. And so that's what we did. A few of us have got together with the Resource Council UK, and we've now updated the 2021 um, guideline. The draft is available for comments. You've got, I think, three or four more days to comment if you want to. It's available online. Um, and then we'll be publishing by March, we hope, the new guideline for healthcare workers in the UK. And there are some significant differences um, in what we're planning. And I'll just summarize these on the slide here. The first is increased emphasis on adrenaline being given every five minutes, an emphasis on posture when people are having anaphylaxis, new recommendations over steroids and antihistamines that actually they should not be routinely used for the acute management. There are new algorithms and new guidance on how long you have to be observed for following an anaphylaxis reaction. So let me take you through some of the key changes. 
On the left of your screens is the old guideline algorithm, on the right is the new one. And so the first crucial thing here is an emphasis on giving I am adrenaline every five minutes in to someone who is still having features of anaphylaxis and no evidence of response. And that has to be the crucial part of managing, guide, managing someone with anaphylaxis, whether you're a healthcare worker or not, in a clinical setting or not, in a community, in a school, on the street. If you've got, you've ever, people have two pens, if the first pen doesn't work and you're still having symptoms of anaphylaxis, have a second dose. And if needed, a third dose and a fourth dose and so on because that was missing from the original algorithm. Yes, it said repeat adrenaline, but if you look at the picture, it would imply that you just give one adrenaline dose and then you get lost in a whole load of different pink and orange, yellow colored boxes. And you've got to keep your eye on the clock and keep giving more adrenaline. Secondly, the idea of posture being important that you should lie the patient flat or if they're having breathing issues, which usually is the case for food allergy and food anaphylaxis, sit them up in a comfortable position, just like you would do in someone in having a severe asthma attack. And the reason for that is because there are now a number of reports, both in the UK and America and Australia, of people being stood up or being told to walk to the first aid room in schools or walking from the home or the school to the ambulance, where that has triggered decompensation and death. We've got rid of this nonsense of a chlorphenamin and hydrocortisone. And let me explain to you why. So there is now reasonable data in to look at whether corticosteroids help. And the reason we might give steroids is to try and reduce the likelihood of what we call a biphasic reaction. This is where the initial reaction subsides. And then anything between one and 12 or even 72 hours later, there's a further sort of push of symptoms all of a sudden out of the blue. And what was found in this very large meta-analysis is that steroids do not help reduce the risk of anaphylaxis. Now, actually, they reported it increased the risk, but there is a clear confounding here that the people who are more likely to get steroids were the people who are having more severe reactions. And we know severity is linked to the risk of that biphasic reaction. What concerns me more is this new data that was published um, in print um, at the very end of 2019, where they showed that pre-hospital use of steroids was associated with an increased risk of hospital admission and intensive care. And that existed despite adjusting for severity. So here we now have evidence that not only do corticosteroids not help, with preventing biphasic reactions, they might actually be harmful. And we don't quite understand why. There is huge amount of data there to show that people faff around with steroids and chlorphenamine or pyroton or whatever it may be. And maybe that delays timely treatment with further adrenaline. And also we are, are well aware of data from hospitals, including in the UK, that four times the number of patients with anaphylaxis get steroids as get adrenaline. And that is one of the main reasons that both hydrocortisone and antihistamines are no longer recommended in the acute management of typical anaphylaxis. Don't get distracted. If they're having anaphylaxis, give adrenaline. Once the anaphylaxis has resolved, then think about, think about antihistamines because they may help get rid of the itch and the skin symptoms. They don't help for biphasic reactions and don't even consider steroids unless you're in dire straits. We'll come to that now. So this is the crucial change that if you are still having significant anaphylaxis symptoms after two appropriate doses of adrenaline, you need to rapidly escalate and not sit on your patient because these are the patients who are at risk of dying. And what is happening when people have anaphylaxis or indeed even mild reactions is that there is significant fluid redistribution out of the gut. And there are data that I don't have time to show you today that one third of your circulating volume, so if you're an adult, that's about one and a half liters, disappears out of your blood within five to 10 minutes of anaphylaxis. And not quite as extreme as that, but a significant fluid redistribution happens even if you're not having anaphylaxis. 
And in most of us, what happens is that there's less blood going back to the heart. The heart realizes this and so starts to pump faster. And that maintains the amount of blood being pumped out of the body. But in some people, they can't compensate. Maybe they've lost too much fluid or it's too much of an allergic insult, or actually some people are just less good at dealing with anaphylaxis in much the same way that people with haemophiliac disease aren't very good at clotting. Maybe that's the same for allergy that some people just can't cope with an allergic reaction. And so these people end up with fluid leak causing airway edema, that's what causes the asthma symptoms and hypoxia, reduced cardiac output, that in turn exacerbates our hypoxia and can cause hypotension, low blood pressure, and it's that combined that results in shock and this vicious negative feedback circle. And that's what we need to intervene in. And adrenaline works beautifully. This is someone who's having a sting venom challenge. Actually, this is to the Jack Jumper ants in Tasmania, just off Australia. And S is where they get stung. And you can see that there, what happens is that there's within minutes, a massive drop in blood pressure. They become tachycardic, that's that reflex compensation. If they get adrenaline and fluids, and this is a low dose adrenaline infusion plus fluid, there's a beautiful response. That's in contrast to this patient who's been stung by some wasp venom in an anesthetic room. And you can see that within minutes of the sting, their blood pressure has crashed. And each black square here is an intravenous bolus dose given by a bit of a gung-ho anaesthetist. And you can see it does diddly squat to that blood pressure until at 40 minutes a noradrenaline infusion is started. And so if you're having this sort of presentation of anaphylaxis, Yes, you are going to die because one or two doses of adrenaline is not going to help you. And so if you get to hospital and you are in this sort of situation, don't faff around. We need to spot these patients and rapidly escalate. And this is probably why one third of fatalities in the UK to food happen despite timely adrenaline, because they just need more adrenaline than can be given by an adrenaline pen and more fluids than, again, would normally be considered. And so in the new guideline, we are actively encouraging people to recognize when it's refractory anaphylaxis, recognize when two doses have been given and these people are still wheezing or still hypertensive. And when that happens, get expert help. And in particular, we're trying to steer people towards a low dose intravenous adrenaline infusion, which can be given down a peripheral cannula. And there is no reason why this can't be given in every single emergency department in the country. In Australia, paramedics do this. What's important is that you get expert in help, expert advice to help you, and that people realize that things are really at stake here. And if we do this, this is how we're going to save some of the people who are currently dying. And it's safe. We've published a case series of four patients very recently who all had very severe reactions multiple doses of intramuscular adrenaline, which actually made them worse rather than better in terms of symptoms of anaphylaxis. And then within five to 10 minutes of beginning of the adrenaline infusion, very, very rapid recovery. So adrenaline works. The reason why people die is because they don't get enough adrenaline in a safe environment and fluid support. And then this is my last slide. We've realized that the current guidance for discharge was a little bit one person chasing the other person. So NICE said, do what RCUK says. RCUK, Resource Council UK, UK said, do what NICE says. And actually we've now looked at the evidence and the evidence essentially, the reason to keep people in is because they might have a biphasic reaction. Now 50% of biphasic reactions happen after 12 hours. So we then need to think, What's the point of keeping everyone for six hours when actually half the people in about 5% of people will have biphasic reactions after 12 hours? And so we are now proposing a risk stratified approach, which I hope is music to your ears, particularly those of us who do allergy challenges in hospital, where previously you could accuse us of breaking nice guidance, where we're saying after two hours observation, if it was a good response to adrenaline and there was rapid resolution of symptoms and the people already know, the families already know what to do or the patient has adrenaline pens and so on, consider fast track discharge. Whereas if they're one of these severe 
risk factors, these patients need to be admitted overnight because these are the ones where we are worried they may have the biphasic reaction. So please do keep an eye out on the guideline when it comes out in a couple of months time. If you've got any comments, if you vehemently disagree with anything I've said, go online, let us know your reasons for that because we will consider feedback most surely. And hopefully this will make improve the level of care for acute anaphylaxis in the UK and actually provide the evidence base that's been lacking for many of the guidelines until now. And lastly, and I hope you won't shoot me, it's wonderful that beat anaphylaxis is developing its local resource, but don't forget, particularly for schools, there's also the Spare Pens in Schools website to use alongside the beat anaphylaxis website, where there will be updated information over the next year or two appearing, and we'll certainly feed that through to the beat anaphylaxis website so that we can in particular make people in schools, both teachers, parents and pupils, feel reassured that the schools are on top of managing allergic reactions when they happen on their premises. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. That was a really clear presentation of quite complex issues um, and the practical implications. So thank you very much for that. Now, um, we've got time for a couple of questions. Um, uh, in the midst of Paul's talk, I lost Wi-Fi connection, so I haven't got all of the, connect, uh, all of the questions, but uh, I know uh, uh, Louise, my colleague, had asked a couple. So I wonder whether I could ask Louise to put your camera on, introduce yourself to everyone, and ask Paul, uh, share your questions with the whole audience this evening. Thanks, Jill. Um, hello, Paul, nice to see you. Hope all's well down there. Um, and, and thanks for a great talk. I think it's it's um, a, a new way that we are having presentations here with um, our public in the Northeast. So my questions to you actually are, um, with all that knowledge that you've presented to us, um, one of the things I think will be really helpful for the families in the audience is, my first question was to differentiate, we always talk about asthma as being high risk for anaphylaxis, but I've definitely got lots of families where little ones have viral induced wheeze, bronchiolitis, recurrent chest infections. So it was to clarify to the audience, is it any child with respiratory disease, any child with compromise who you would consider high risk, or are we just thinking about those children with multi-system allergy and, and, and difficult asthma? So it's an excellent question, and I suspected Louise was going to ask something that I could waffle on for hours about. Um, it's a really complicated area, and I think we failed miserably to try and get the message or non-messages over. Um, unfortunately, what happened is that it was noted that a few people in some deaths in America due to food anaphylaxis had asthma. And from that came this myth that asthma is a massive risk factor for fatal anaphylaxis. And we've been fighting and pushing back against that ever since. Um, the UK data shows that roughly seven out of 10 people with fatal food anaphylaxis have asthma. But asthma is really common in people with allergies. And the majority of people with, who die of food anaphylaxis, there's no evidence that their asthma is poorly controlled. Mm -hmm. So I think what, for me personally, what we're talking about here is asthma is really common in people with food allergy. That's why we see the pattern. When you die of food allergy, or when you have anaphylaxis to food allergy, it's because people with food allergy are very likely to have asthma as well. And there are some studies from around the world where one in two children with food allergy have asthma, and half of the half that don't have asthma probably have undiagnosed asthma or at least underlying bronchial hyperreactivity and they're the viral reasons and so on. So of course, most people having food anaphylaxis have asthma because they, most people have food allergy have asthma. There are some data from the USA very recently, it's not been published, but it was presented at the pediatrics conference, AAP conference, which is like their main pediatric association that found that having asthma is not a risk factor for anaphylaxis. Although the problem with that study was that they did not assess the level of asthma control. And I think we need to stop trying to be clever here, especially when there really isn't the evidence at the moment. If you've got asthma, or if you're prone to wheezing, it makes sense 
to get those symptoms under control because they are affecting your health and they're affecting your quality of life and in children they're affecting your growth and so on. And that then leads me on to, I think your second question, which is when you come to hospital, if there is a chance that if you come to hospital, you've had anaphylaxis, don't give that patient steroids because they don't need it. However, if they've got uncontrolled asthma or wheezing, and you think that will benefit from a short course of steroids, then give them steroids, but you're not giving them steroids for the anaphylaxis. You're giving them steroids to help them with their free respiratory complaints. And I think if we can separate those two, we'll make it safer for people because we'll get better lung, you know, asthma or wheezing control. And on top of that, we won't be risking adverse outcomes in anaphylaxis by throwing steroids at anyone. And I think now it's very clear that there is something going wrong when we give people steroids. It may well be it's just delaying a more appropriate treatment. That's what I suspect. But if, they, if you don't need steroids, don't prescribe steroids. And anaphylaxis on its own, normal anaphylaxis is not an indication for steroids. But having anaphylaxis when you're wheezy or anyway, or in the context of a viral exacerbation, if it's appropriate to have steroids, prescribe. But do it for that reason. No, I, th I think you're absolutely right. I think it's it's absolutely right now, especially when IACI guidance will also come out, that we have to tease out and separate the difference between anaphylaxis and acute exacerbation of asthma. If there's an overlap, then it'll be treated. But as you say, what's really nice about these new guidance, and we've had this debate in IACI as well, is how long do you wait to give that adrenaline? And, you know, we've heard it just recently. I've just seen it last week on the wards late at night. It, it's just that for far too often, the antihistamine and the steroid is given early. Adrenaline always delayed. And if we can abolish the middleman, get the adrenaline in, and in those five minutes while things are evolving, you'll see, I think, with the data coming out that it'll be really different. And hopefully even the rebound will will disappear in a sense if we're not using steroids. So I completely agree that um, the side effects of steroids in anaphylaxis in both guidance will change. Um, and so no thanks, Paul, it, uh, really clear, clear guidance. I've got a few other questions, but I'll come back later. Thanks very much, Louise, that's super. For the purposes of time, I'm going to um, hand on to Andrew to talk about our local data Paul, you'll see that there's a, a couple of questions in our chat. I'll put it in the chat, yeah. From um, uh, two colleagues who are, uh, uh, who are secondary care paediatric colleagues, uh, uh, Sachin and Prashant, thank you for picking up those questions. And then we can all keep a look at that chat room at the same time. So let me hand over to Andrew um, and let's hear from you. <laughs> 